a very good evening and a warm welcome to everyone present in the webinar we are highly honored and delighted to host a two day international webinar on reliant and emerging india post covid 19 <coughs> organized by department of commerce and department of iqac in collaboration with eastern india regional council institute of chartered accountants of india the outbreak of covid 19 pandemic has caused severe problems in almost all the countries of the world the government of all countries doctors experts institutions and academicians are all working together in the construction of a new path for future in accordance with the present scenario with many countries initiating lockdowns economic output in almost all the countries have seen a huge downfall unemployment problem is rising many people have faced this problem because of this economic slowdown an already slowing indian economy has been derailed from its growth track after a stringent shutdown has been imposed since march 2020 the sectors on which indian economy had been growing have all been adversely affected such as manufacturing sector service sectors exports consumption capital flows etc the role that india plays in the post pandemic world will be determined by how we deal with the crisis now and how we emerge from it will we emerge stronger or weaker as a nation or will we walk towards an inclusive india that holds all of us together in its fold regardless of caste creed or class this pandemic has brought all of us to an inflection point i hope this webinar will address various issues and will focus on different avenues to strengthen india's global pos position and also to improve india's domestic market and to drive export i humbly request professor shormishta dashgupta to deliver the welcome address to our dignitaries thank you for joining us over to professor shormishta dashgupta good evening our principal madam has just informed us that she could not be present uh, today for the webinar as she is stuck with some urgent work and where the connectivity is poor so uh, she requested us to organize today's program without her presence and she will be there for tomorrow's session and will address tomorrow's session so on behalf of her i welcome all of you present for today's webinar this is a two day international webinar arranged by the commerce department and iqac of herambuchandra college in collaboration with the eastern india regional council of the institute of chartered accountants of india uh, i welcome all of you and i wish everyone would enjoy the webinar Uh, now it is our pleasure and we are honored to have with us today as a special guest ca mr nitesh kumar more chairman of the eastern india regional council of uh, institute of chartered accountants of india by his consent the webinar has been organized in collaboration with eirc of icai the institute which is the second largest accounting body in the world 
and uh, formed under an act of parliament. It is really an honor for us to be associated with the Institute. And we wish to have a long standing relation with the Institute, especially uh, that will uh, be very much helpful for our students. And uh, we that will benefit our students. Incidentally, in this webinar, out of the four speakers, uh, three of them are members of the institute. I would uh, be, it would be great to hear a few words from our guest. And I request all of you to be present and uh, attend the webinar. Sure, you will enjoy it. Thank you. Yeah, good evening, everyone. Uh, Madam uh, Sarmista ji, uh, dignitary is present here and dear students. Uh, the topic for the webinar is impact uh, of the COVID-19. Uh, in the post-COVID-19, uh, what is the impact which we are going to analyze and uh, uh, what one can see? Uh, uh, I would uh, discuss some of the positive impact of the COVID-19. We had much, many times we had discussed and we will be discussing about the negative impact of the COVID-19. But I would today, friends, will be discussing three major positive impact of COVID-19 on this world in on globally that will happen. One, it will start work from home, home culture. Now, a company in the US, they can hire an employee who, uh, who can work from his home in the Minapur in a uh, 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 in the west Bengal. so how this is possible that covid this has taught us to uh, to adapt the technology and now the many companies they are hiring and uh, they are uh, it will uh, it will reduce the establishment cost of the company on the one hand and on the other hand the employees they, they, they join the home, uh, the, uh, their village and their town and not moving to the uh, companies that can work from their home and they can serve to any company globally. So, so this COVID had taught this as and this will give us the enduring benefit which will flow to this world even after post COVID. The second is friends, the virtual meetings. Friends, we were not adaptable to this type of virtual meetings before this COVID, but this COVID had tossed the uh, talk, this lockdown has only taught this virtual meetings without wasting our time, without moving to a pla one place to other place. Now, any person in the world, they can, they can have meeting, they can have seminars, they can have any type of talk which are beneficial for the all. This COVID, this is the impact of this COVID friends. Then the government initiative. All the countries of the world, they have spent 10 to 20% of the GDP. Due to this COVID, they had announced the policy. And even India, the, our prime minister, he has dreamed of the self-reliant Bharat and he has promised 20% of the GDP and so many initiative has been announced and each of the department of the ministry, each ministry is working on to achieve this dream. All the ministers, central ministers, state governments, they are working to achieve this dream and their aim is now self-reliant Bharat. How, who taught this? Uh, uh, the work from whole culture, home culture, whether it is the virtual meeting and whether the so many initiatives which the government has announced. <coughs> it is only due to the COVID-19. It is the positive, third positive impact, friends. So with this, thank you. Thank you, everyone. I wish this international conference a success, great success, grand success. And ICI is very, uh, on behalf of the Institute of Chartered Accountant Eastern Region, I, 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 I wish a great success. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.
Thank you, sir. Now, uh, I would request Chotodruti Chakraborty to introduce our first speaker for the first session. Hello and welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us at today's webinar. I am Shatadruti Chakraborty from the Department of Commerce, Herambo Chandra College. And I take this opportunity to introduce our first speaker for the session, Mr. Joydeep Banerjee. Mr. Joydeep Banerjee is the General Manager, Budget and Accounts, CESC Limited. He is the member of the Institute of Chartered Accountants of India and the Institute of Cost Accountants of India with more than 25 years of professional experience. In the current role, he has the overall responsibility of financial accounting, cost accounting, budgetary control, financial systems, including ERP, setting up of the accounting processes in new business ventures and re-engineering of business processes for cost reduction and efficiency improvement by utilizing automation tools. He has been the visiting faculty of reputed B schools like XLRI and IMI. Today, he will be sharing his insights on changes in the industrial sector in recent times. Sir, we would love to hear from you, Mr. Joydeep Banerjee. Yeah, good evening, viewers. Uh, hopefully, I'm audible. OK. Um, so the topic <clears throat> on which um, we will be discussing today is a very much contemporary topic and um, uh, issue a lot of challenges, a lot of hope, a lot of um, futuristic <clears throat> outlook needs to be thought of while we discuss on this topic of emerging India. Uh, so for this purpose, uh, I do have a very short presentation, which I'd like to share. Yes, sir, it is right. Carry on. Okay. okay thank you. Now, uh, the area that I'll be covering is basically the, I'll be giving a broad overview of the effect of COVID and the post-COVID impact on the industrial sector. Now, COVID-19 is basically a global societal crisis. Now, what are the impacts, broad impacts of COVID-19, what has happened, which we have seen, I'd like to touch upon. First of all, it has turned out to be a global pandemic known to all of us. And it has led to an unprecedented lockdown, which nobody thought of. The entire running of the economy came to a standstill for a certain period of time. As of today, we really don't have a foolproof solution to this COVID-19 yet. Although a lot of effort, a lot of research is going on globally to come out with some kind of good news is really expected by each one of us. On account of this COVID-19, the entire workforce is under mental stress <clears throat> as well as financial distress. 
it is basically an uncertainty packed disruption which nobody ever thought of leading to economic downturn now on account of this economic downturn there has been financial stress which has disrupted the supply chain and demand which i'll definitely cover up later on followed by a phased unlocking of the industry when there was a lockdown we initially thought of that it will be a matter of few days and everything will be fine but it has not really happened when the unlocking started it also started in a phased manner which is still on and we at industry have started operating started performing keeping the social distancing norms in mind this itself this situation calls for a relook into the business scenario business strategy the entire thought of business leaders have brought in a reword r e wherever there was a strategy we need to re-strategize so we will look into those repeated usage of the two letters r e while we proceed in this context government has got a very crucial critical role and lot of government initiatives are there towards recovery this is a very generic kind of thing which has happened all across the globe and india is no exception to it additionally india has got a huge population to feed and to operate an economy which is diverse now what are the broad shift in industry outlook that has really happened number one is the entire meeting structure and methodology has got changed in fact uh, mr moore was telling about the positives of this meeting structure number 2 is the industry leaders are rethinking relooking into the way they have been leading the day to day business number 3 very important the use of technology and systems has been totally different it is in fact we will discuss the digital penetration part also at the later part of the presentation now what it calls for today is since we are rethinking we are again starting on the functioning so an approach to innovation will be the differentiator we need to work on innovation and innovative ideas innovative innovative approaches to meet such challenge in fact at industry level the core processes which are run in the organization are really thought of lot of modification lot of amendments the resources the human resources who are running the industry right now is also so critical the approach towards such talent and the skills are also getting relooked into and a new cultural aspiration and behavioral mindset is really emerging when there are challenges we have always seen in the past that 
new opportunities also do emerge. And that, that is the source of this new cultural aspiration and behavioral mindset. In fact, interaction with external stakeholders have also changed drastically. The thought of product and service portfolio, which each and every industry typically used to plan off, is thought differently. And various industries are thinking of various types of partnerships in the broader ecosystem. In fact, when I talk of partnership, it would be worthwhile to mention to you that during this lockdown phase, you will find that one of the key industry in India, that is the Reliance Group, has entered into a large number of partnership. Some are strategic, some are financial, to meet the financial need. But these are all to strengthen the overall functioning of the organization in post-COVID era. So it, we can conclude with this that the overall corporate purpose has been a bit changed now. So the industries in India need to act fast on differentiating opportunities in order to ensure the top line security and customer trust in the midst of COVID-19 crisis. In this context, I would like to mention that when we talk of industry, there are a lot of sectors within industry amongst whom there are certain sectors who are very much adversely affected like travel and tourism, like uh, entertainment. Uh, uh, they really don't know how to again come back within their old form we as the user of those industry, we also don't know what is the future of travel and tourism or entertainment. In fact, government is also thinking seriously on this count. Discretionary spending is now consumers are not thinking of. So that is another area which has been grossly impacted in a negative way. Challenges are there in manufacturing sector, service sector, import dependent sector, auto ancillary and auto sector, which is a very big sector in our industrial sector, industrial presence in the country. But there are silver linings as well. IT, e-commerce, telecom, data-driven industry, pharma, insurance. These sectors are finding opportunities in this particular scenario. So each and every sector is thinking differently to remain floated and succeed in post-COVID era. Now, when we are thinking of restarting India, I'll be discussing three, four, five critical aspects which are generally applicable to the entire industrial sector. The first and foremost, which we, I'll be discussing is the steering of top line security and customer trust. Now, for any industry, it is really a challenge now to ensure top line. 
Now, what to do? How to remain relevant? For that, there are broadly three aspects. One is to re-strategize across sectors and geographies. Number two is reimagine operating models for new reality. And number three is redefine customer value proposition. Now, what does the each area mean? When we talk of re-strategize across sectors and geographies, the first point that do come is the different sectors are expected to experience differential impact on output growth this year. As I have discussed, there are certain sectors which are very much adversely affected. Some are affected in part, some favorably as well, if, if we consider it to be an opportunity. Now, for those sectors where there is a tremendous negative impact, there is a need to de-risk exposure to high impacted areas. Each and every industry leader is thinking in this way. There are researches also which are going on how to de-risk, whether the thought process will yield result in days to come. Number two is global trade flow expected to alter in post-COVID world. For this purpose, there is a need for advanced planning and reassess the international strategy. So the import-export dependent industry needs to realign themselves after reassessing the international strategy of trade. And number three is the demand in India is expected to vary across regions based on the impact and propensity to buy. For this purpose, industry is reprioritizing efforts at a micro market level. So whatever industry thought of pre at the pre-COVID era, they are now rethinking, reprioritizing, and reassessing to re-strategize across sectors and geographies. Now, if we come to the second part, which is reimagine operating models for new reality. For this purpose, each and every industry has understood that customer safety is becoming a top priority. If we are to retain customer, then customer safety needs to be ensured. So industries have started taking measures to rebuild customer confidence for the purpose of trust. They are re-engineering operating models to include safety protocols. For being agile, they are innovating workflows to cater to changing fulfillment needs. And for being collaborative, they are forging new partnerships to enable last mile deliveries. And lastly, to leverage on the digital, they are exploring end-to-end -end digital offering to enhance customer convenience. At the end of the day, each and every industry knows that customer is at the top. So whatever they are to do, they are to realign themselves to re remain relevant to their customers. Coming to the third aspect, that is redefining customer value proposition. It is an economic impact which has started to reflect in the customer spend sentiment. We are really thinking whether we should incur an expenditure, whether it will be worthwhile to enter at this point of time. 
Understanding this sentiment, the companies have started taking measures to stimulate demand. For this purpose, they are experimenting with new product and service offerings. They are reassessing the pricing strategy to drive value perception. In order to protect the existing customer base, they are reallocating spends to emerging and high potential segments, which means that the all industries are relooking on each and every operative territory to remain relevant. And lastly, enhancing the digital presence through digital marketing. Now, these are all, all aspects which are relevant for each and every sector. And each and every sector is looking into their business their typicality and reworking on the path forward. Now, different sectors are expected to be impacted differently along the demand and supply factors. Now, what are the factors which are affecting demand across sectors? There are certain representative things which I have mentioned here. There are other factors as well. First of all is the change in consumer spending behavior. Earlier, the consumer spending behavior was quite different if we consider the pre-COVID-19 scenario. A higher spend is now dedicated for the essential categories, including health and wellness. Lower spend is on discretionary categories. People are now quite skeptical. Should we, should we spend on the discretionary item? Will we be able to sail through? Because the future is not really clear. There are lots of clouds in our long-term vision. Number two is the change in businesses spending behavior. Lower spent on discretionary sectors and related activities have already crept into the business mindset. Because ultimately, whatever we are spending, it flows into the customer in the form of value proposition. Number three is share of domestic demand from high COVID-19 impact regions in India. If we think of the areas where COVID-19 has been highly impacted, the demand also has been grossly impacted in those areas. So this is another factor which is making the industry leaders think and rethink. Fourth, most another very important thing is the availability of credit to the B2B and B2C customers. If we really don't have the liquidity, how will, as a consumer, we will purchase? If we don't have liquidity as a business, how will we sustain? So the availability of credit is very important factor from the demand perspective. And lastly, risk of contagion in product or service consumption. Consumers are thinking and rethinking, should we take it? Should we consume? And they are very much careful, more careful, more scared of taking things forward. But there is a possibility that this is a short term uh, mechanism with coming in of a vaccine or medicine or some solution to this problem. Hopefully this particular issue should get resolved. Now, what are the factors that are affecting supply across sectors? 
One is the impact on domestic supply chain partners and the ecosystem. Number two is the import dependency on high COVID-19 impact countries. Number three is the labor availability constraints and labor migration. And number four is the workforce productivity given the social distancing protocols. Now, these are very practical issues which have really cropped up, which we all know. So the industry leaders are also considering keeping these factors in mind while strategizing for future to remain relevant. Now, in this context, I would like to mention about the supply chain disruption. Since there is a time shortage, I'm not going deep into the each and every area. Uh, now, in one way, the supply chain disruption is an opportunity as well. If we think of today's government uh, outlook, government support is there to enhance capabilities that are there in the country to manufacture products within the country. As an example, I've mentioned here that if we consider a pharma sector, pharma sector has lots of giants supplying medicine or medical items globally. They are global giants, but they are dependent on import of their APIs. API means active pharmaceutical ingredients. In fact, maximum dependency on this count is on China. So, government is thinking to incentivize API manufacturing within the country. This would give a strong backward integration to the pharma sector. Their dependency on outside countries will get reduced, but it is not an overnight activity, it's a journey. Number two area which has been grossly affected by this global scenario is the electronic sector, where again, all key electronic sector giants are heavily dependent on import for their spare parts. So, if such outside dependency can be reduced, we can really be relevant and we can emerge as a self-dependent, self-reliant country in future. Now, for doing this, if we are to really strengthen our supply chain, the very important aspect that is required is the infrastructural strengthening. We really need strong infrastructural support so that within the country, supply chain connectivity is the best. So far as MSME sector is concerned, since they are small sectors, micro and small sector is basically uh, the sector which provides a lot of raw material to various industrial sectors, but they need a support today. Their workforce has gone. Remigration has not yet happened fully. They really are facing a lot of liquidity crisis. So they really need governmental support, which of course government is working on. A lot of RBI directives are coming. A lot of initiatives are on to support MSME sector so that supply chain can be strengthened. And lastly, Indian economy 
to be open to trade with others without being dependent means we can import we should export but not being dep dependent on outsiders if possible we need to manufacture from within we need to integrate internally to strengthen our value chain to be relevant so the post covid 19 era is a journey towards inclusive industrial growth for self reliance and self sufficient we really don't know sitting today whether it is fully achievable or not but we really look forward to achieve the best coming to the next next aspect is the risk management i will just touch upon this this is the area which has evolved in midst of covid 19 as an opportunity of service since we are more digitally dependent on one hand the financial institutions are operating with a slash down rate which has been directed by the central bank rbi and rbi has been giving lot of incentives to inject liquidity to move on but there is a need to change the way financial institutions are running now there is a need to adapt fast to this new normal scenario now the question that comes is how risk management needs to realign itself to the new realities of the post covid 19 world so that the financial institutions become robust and resilient for this purpose the first and foremost thing that is required is the need to be agile if the financial institutions become agile to ensure alignment with the new realities of the operating environment then the loans that they will be giving they will become more performing loans the financial institutions are working on to calibrate their risk appetite opting for low risk assets they are now becoming really careful while lending the second point is while there was a pre covid push towards digitization but covid 19 has accelerated the same an increase in acceptance and usage of advanced analytics are expected across the entire banking value chain these changes coupled with the focus on increasing efficiencies and cost reductions are expected to bring structural change in the overall functioning of the financial institutions but this do have an effect it is expected that these financial institutions will become leaner and more agile in future with these aspects the role of risk management is now getting changed it was initially a controlling function which is expected to be a business advisory function in order to preserve the business value chain for this purpose the risk managers are required to look into the credit risk the liquidity risk the operational risk and the capital management and the recovery and resolution planning as the financial business shifts from the traditional outlook traditional concepts 
data and real time information driven analytics are set to be the backbone of the new operating model in fact this reminds me of the great in the, the one of the biggest industrialist of the country uh, mr mukesh ambani when he spoke in the last agm that data is the ultimate is the thing for future that is the reason why reliance also have thought of gradually shifting from the core oil business to the geo platform which is purely a data platform the next a perspective is the cyber security while we are thinking of the extremely high usage of digital platform we are simultaneously working from home we are working from remote places we are serving to countries cross cross border uh, clients so the risk that we are exposed to so far as cyber security is concerned has enhanced broadly it is cropping out of two major aspects one is the lack of security awareness when the individuals are working from home or from any space they are it is a multi usage of the same machine or the same infrastructure and each and every individual is not fully aware of the security measures which are required to stop the cyber attack the next aspect is the logical engineering which has which is a target of the cyber attackers on the system and technology if any organization is carrying any software which is dated or which is not having adequate security firewall then it is becoming vulnerable and it is getting exposed to the cyber attack so the new normal of remote working has put the focus firmly on cyber security trust and protecting data covid-19 has forced the businesses in several sectors by requiring them to confront their digital preparedness in tackling cyber threats head on there is no time we need to act fast we need to operate with the highest level of cyber security in order to combat cyber threat in fact in the post covid 19 world cyber attackers increasingly seeking to exploit the vulnerabilities in an organization's security infrastructure that the shift to remote working has exposed to so each and every organization is giving their necessary thought they, they are incurring they are investing on this in order to protect themselves from cyber attack coming to the last perspective which i'll discuss is the organization organizational learning frankly speaking this is a rare bright spot which has boomed the organizational learning although covid-19 pandemic has turned into an unprecedented humanitarian and economic disaster now if we look at how the organization organizations are conducting their learning and development activities i have mentioned here three trends which have emerged in the organizational learning first one is covid-19 crisis has highlighted 
the potential of digital learning. The physical learning opportunity today no more exists, but we need to impart learning within the organization to make our resources relevant and perform at the desired level. So everything has moved to online platform, including the field staff training. With this digitization, the geographical distances were rendered irrelevant and trainers, especially for niche domain, have become readily available to the entire globe. Whoever is a specialist, you can reach him and you can bring him and you can take advice from him remotely. This environment, this mindset was not really there earlier in the organization. Second point is the change in the learning agenda. A boundaryless organizational learning has emerged. Whoever wants to learn within the organization, the entire repository is available within the organization in various forms and it's getting updated. This includes the skill development, the mental and physical well-being, adapting to changed operating models of the organization, functional and domain training. So it is itself becoming a big repository of data available for knowledge, whoever wants to take. Now the challenge is there, so far as this learning is concerned, is whoever wants to have. In an organization, if somebody is reluctant on this, that there is a direct effect on his or her performance. So the human resource is now getting compelled to adapt to such learning philosophy. Third point is the efficiency jump in learning and development. It has been observed through various researches within the country by BCG, KPMG, uh, and various other uh, research organizations is while the learning and development budgets have been reduced 25 to 30 percent across the board typical metrics like coverage and training hours are on track and we'll see a significant increase by the end of the financial year this change is perhaps an irreversible change for greater learning, which is expected to increase with more and more of technology penetration to the last mile. To an organization, this might turn out to be a cost-effective measure in the long run as well, to impart same level of training at a much more controlled cost. So COVID-19 pandemic has forced the companies to shift to digital learning, leading to massive efficiency gain for learning and development. But this efficiency is not enough as a differentiator. To emerge stronger, the l &D teams will have to focus on how to harness the real power of digital and sharpen their insights to create learning that impacts both the individual and the organization. This will be, this is really a radical change in organizational learning mechanism. So with this, I would like to con conclude and thank you to all of you. Thank you, Mr. Joydeep Banerjee. Good evening, everyone. Uh, this is Ishika Ghosh, faculty of Hirambuchandra College, Department of Commerce. And I would like to introduce our next speaker, Mr. Kosab Das Gupta, director and advisory leader of PWC SDC Kolkata. Mr. Das Gupta is the advisory leader of PWC's India Acceleration Center, Kolkata, 
He is a chartered accountant with more than 25 years of experience and has a true global perspective and deep cultural insights. He worked with clients all around the world across multiple industries to provide solutions on broad range of advisory services, including strategy and management consulting, data analytics, mergers and acquisitions, valuations, internal firm projects. His current role as an advisory leader includes strategic planning, stakeholder management, change management, where he leads a team of more than 1400 diversely qualified professionals and thus is involved in building tomorrow's leaders. Today, he'll be sharing with us his expert opinion on the overview of the changes in the service sector. So without any further ado, I request Mr. Das Gupta to enrich us with his opinion. Mr. Das Gupta. Yeah, thank you, Professor Ghosh. I hope I'm audible. Yes, and, sir, you're audible. Uh, and uh, just maybe I'll uh, present my screen. Is the screen visible now? Oh, uh, sorry, I just need to uh, share the screen uh, bear with a moment so is the screen visible yes sir just a minute is is, is it visible is the slide visible yes sir it's visible okay okay sure so uh good evening and uh, definitely uh thanks for giving this wonderful opportunity to speak to the students and uh, the faculty of Herimba Chandra College and some others. And uh, of course, a big thanks to uh, Mr. Banerjee because he so well set up the context of uh, the industrial changes and how the self-reliant uh, economy would be poised and the very uh, certain the underlying changes that the economy overall is be, would be going through, and particularly from an industrial perspective, uh, really sets the context. Uh, first of all, I'm no expert on uh, economy. I'm not a trained economist, but uh, uh, and uh, this is my own opinion. I mean, this presentation is uh, and nothing to do with WC's opinion. But I thought that I would take the audience today through certain details of uh, what are the turns and changes in the service sector that is coupling with this pandemic and how it can give a lot of tailwind and acceleration and link with certain bigger plans and future strengths of development that are really sustainable and permanent changes. So the pandemic, of course, has created an unprecedented impact. And as we are coming to terms with this persistent nature and we are adjusting our lives around it, there are ways and means to restart the economy, which has been suspended for months. Now, of course, we realize that there's a need for an actionable intelligence, innovation, and a lot of ideation around this. The first part, which I want to touch up, is a great digital shift, the digitization of the payments and banking that is going on. So you see the payment landscape has witnessed a disruptive change because consumers have moved almost voraciously towards a contactless payment because of the fear of the infection. And even the spending in essential vendors, uh, you know, uh, retail or even local travel like a taxi or a metro ride is being made, the payment is being made totally contactless. And uh, most of you have heard about uh, the concept of an unified payments interface. Now this
Am I audible now? Hello. Hello. Can you hear me? Okay. Can you hear me now? Thank you. So let me just start start all over again. The I think the headphone is creating a bit of a problem. Uh, is my screen uh, visible? Can somebody just give me a feedback? Is my screen visible? Just a minute, just a minute, please. Uh, no. One minute, one minute. Is the screen visible, please? I'm just going to tell you what's the color of the world I was going to share for free. Sir, please carry on. Slide share screen. Yeah. Uh, can you, uh, are you presenting or, or may I, shall, shall I present? You, you you are presenting, sir. And it is it is it is visible, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you, thank you so much. So sorry, sorry for those uh, technical glitches. So, so the, the payment, uh, so the National Payments Corporation of India is is, is owned by uh, the Indian Banking Association and some uh, mm -hmm. other bank. You see, the UPI in it, it jumped in its transactions from an Indian uh, from a six thousand nine hundred crore to almost a twenty one lakh crore. That that gives you an idea of the rate at which the digital payment economy has been growing in India. If you include the other channels like an IMPS and other renewable payment services and 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 IU payments etc., you would figure out that uh, it it takes a a tally of almost 40 lakh crore and uh, but that is almost a monopoly for this particular corporation the national payments corporation of india but if you see the uh, the adoption of digital payments there's a huge disparity between the urban usage of digital payments which is almost like a 44 percent to a rural payment uh, which is a merely 16 percent so a recent so so that definitely gives us an idea that in India, cash has been the king. And to give you an idea, uh, the currency in circulation, uh, that is rice, that rose almost at a growth, a compounded growth rate of 10.8%, which is close to the GDP growth rate between that period. If you look at the, from the period FI 1516 to FI 1920, the rate at which the currency in circulation grew was very close to the GDP growth rate. And if I quickly look at the ratio of cash that is withdrawn as a ratio to GDP, India stands at a 49.3% as compared with the Singapore at 16% or South Korea of 4.1%. Now, definitely in a very recent change, RBI decided that it is time that they kind of not take the monopoly of the National Payments Corporation of India because one of the, not for any other reason but one of the main reason is that if you depend on a single entity to cover almost one-fifth of the world's population that would be an insurmountable task so they have allowed very recently to form umbrella entities with interoperability so the consumer can move from one particular service provider to another service provider that would of course mitigate the risk and ensure a very stable operations 
So with this, the whole idea is to set up and view this manifolds to make sure that the digital payments would, would cover up the Indian population and break through and make India one of the most fastest digital pay, payment growing economies of the world. To give a recent trend, if you see 80% uh, of Indian consumers actually falling in the age group of 56 to 60 years show the highest usage of digital payment channels, which is followed by the age group of 36 to 45 years, around 83%. So that clearly goes of, of also from our experience that the pandemic has got the people initiated more into digital payments, and this can be leveraged to cover the huge Indian population and kind of take a big uh, jump towards this great digital shift that would help the economy to grow and create much more employment and a lot more other benefits which are associated with, associated with that. Now, another look at the banking sector. The banking has been growing through a lot of automation. The whole way the banking is to operate earlier is going to see changes. The treasury functions are being transformed using a lot of data analytics and artificial intelligence. The backbone of, of a banking system, the payment and settlements, and of course, retail banking. Now, this would change and redefine what is efficiency, considered to be efficiency in the banking and productivity, and also <clears throat> looking at the banking assets and their manpower planning and all others taken together. Because in the retail banking sector, the customer would prefer to conduct his banking mostly from home embracing technology, there'll be a lot of more embracing of technology and expect a quicker execution. So perhaps topping up to all that conceptually, in a very recent news, uh, it came out that India is also looking at to adopt a digital rupee. Of course, this has not been finalized, but the central bank backed digital currencies or a CBDC, a CBDC framework where this is like a Bitcoin using a blockchain technology that you don't have to at all have a bank account to be owning digital currencies and digital transfers won't require any kind of banking system. And with the UPI and the digital payments coming up so strongly, digital, I mean, a CBDC or a, or a digital currency altogether is an idea perhaps which has come, whose, whose time has arrived. And it would of course make things cost effective. It would prevent counterfeit, and big money laundering and the scams like ES Bank and other ILFS, etc., scams that we have seen in the recent uh, past uh, would be definitely taken care of through this system. But of course, this is a very different uh, topic altogether. Looking at certain other sectors, now, <clears throat> before I come to e commerce, let me tell you that in the recent media reports, some of the, uh, some of the sectors that have started getting a lot of investments are around life sciences, biotech and technology. And perhaps I'm going to focus my discussions around technology and mostly around the e-commerce technology and edutech. Now, RBI has also defined that though the technology companies had a very bad year because the corporate technology spending has gone down drastically, but there are significant pockets where the technology companies can do well and a lot of business would pick up in those areas. And perhaps it, it gets related to some of the recent uh, you know, rise in the stock market prices of such the tech giants in India. So let us see that what is the e-commerce uh, you know, uh, ecosystem going to do for technology and where the technology companies as a service sector are going to play a bigger role. See, the ongoing digital transformation in the country is expected that India's total internet user base would would go to about 829 million by 2021. Of course, subject to certain infrastructure and telecommunication implementation. But much of this growth of this has been triggered by the increase in internet and smartphone penetration. And then this growth also relates to the e-commerce, uh, you know, the growth of the e-commerce business that we are talking about. And the Indian e-commerce market is actually expected to grow to an almost US dollars 200 billion by 2026 as of a 38 billion uh, in 2017. So if you see from 17 to 26 in those eight years, the kind of growth that e-commerce is going to see would be phenomenal. And, and uh, you know, and the whole first time users, online users, there's huge changing in the consumer buying pattern, 
uh, which Joydeep was also referring to, would lead to an increase of the change in the business models. And there will be a digitization of the retailers and brands. And we are already seeing certain brands and retailers which were not in the market earlier through their online mode or through a direct uh, consumer uh, D2C mode are constantly launching portals and options for customers and consumers to buy directly from them. So these whole launching of portals, the whole technology transformation that's going to go through, which is going to be fueled by the growth of e-commerce, is definitely a big, big uh, scope for the technology and the technology services, the IT services, to have a lot of uh, growth in, in its own terms. And we can see a lot more self-reliance and resurgency happening in the areas of technology. Moving over to edutech. Now, uh, we, have, we are all, particularly in this seminar, are seeing the, the need for the presence of technology or how technology is going to transform or aid the present delivery of education altogether. To give you a small example, you've all heard about Baiju's. In less than four months in this lockdown, the company added about 20 million new users. Contrast to the first four years, they had it 40 million. 40 million took four years for them to come. And in the four months, they added 20 million new users. The online education market in India is poised to grow by, you know, US dollars 14.33 billion with, a, with the annual rate of growth of over 21%. Of course, the increased penetration of internet and smartphones are the major factors driving this growth. But of course, let's also come with a caveat that this won't happen if the lack of infrastructure and essential learning environment can be big restraining factors. Even in the area of higher education, the space has huge opportunity to grow tenfold by FY25, benefiting from the tailwinds that is caused by COVID. And it is our day-to-day -day experience as, as teachers, as students, as parents, we can understand that what it means today to conduct classes, to conduct exams, and deliver that education to our students. And there is the recent new education policy. It also talks about online education and this regulatory in. Uh, uh, developments and that uh, tailwind from COVID is definitely going to drive this sector, particularly the need for very reliable technology to deliver education and conduct ex conduct exams, etc. and humongous. Another uh, area that I wanted to touch upon is telemedicine. Now we have all seen and perhaps had some brush with telemedicine during this uh, period of lockdown and COVID. To give a context of a bit of a data, the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare data says that there is an 81% shortage of specialists at community health center. Now, don't get me wrong that that is not, telemedicine is not the only solution to it. Solution to a very robust healthcare is the reliability of it, the affordability of it in our country, the quality of the healthcare around the quality education, which, which is absolutely not undermined. But what telemedicine is going to do, changing of those preferences or shifts or try to broaden that shortage at times is, is, is something that would be very interesting observation. There was a change in habit. In most of us, we preferred not to go to the hospital or to the doctors or even to the local doctor's chamber, but perhaps use the phone or various platforms like Practo or you know some other platforms where we could consult a doctor. Now, perhaps this habit is going to persist in the new normal that is going to come. And that's going to give a huge benefit that you can access senior and experienced doctors across all uh, geographical locations. And so the barriers of geography, if you want to consult a doctor in Hyderabad today or in uh, Chennai today, sitting out of Calcutta, you can do it using a telemedicine. A particular study, uh, ENY study says that Indian healthcare industry definitely needs to shift from a traditional in-person doctor-patient interaction to a much more digitally enabled remote consultation. And during COVID, we have realized the importance of that. It says that you know, even it would grow by 31% of an annual growth and it would reach a huge growth of by 2025. It is estimated that almost 15 to 20% of the healthcare ecosystem would be moving into virtual care, consultations, the, deciding the order of the treatment, a remote monitoring, home health management, etc. And a section of the doctors have clearly opined that you know a 15 to 20 percent of the healthcare system can move into telemedicine, and almost 70 percent of a medical cases can involve uh, telemedicine in some form or the other. 
but you know this rapid digitization or this growth would also uh, raise to certain risk challenges because there are data privacy so we need a lot of laws in place and regulations in place to really be- realize the full benefit of telemedicine or to you know have the trust around it uh before i uh, move out uh, maybe i'll i'll give you a two short uh, case studies uh one case study which i picked up was on the tracking industry and along with e-commerce uh, perhaps i wanted to mention that though this year would be a very <clears throat> bad year for the logistics sector which is so much allied with the e-commerce but definitely with help of a lot of digitization around the logistics sector we are going to see a lot of bouncing back of the logistics sector and with growth of the e-commerce warehousing there's huge need for uh, warehousing uh, depending on the warehousing was actually growing at a 25% ro- rate before uh, covid uh but it would definitely take a dip and bounce back now the case around tracking industry is the tracking industry is a backbone of an economic activity and extremely the tracking industry is extremely dependent on paperwork and physical presence on the ground now that led to you know when the lockdown happened a lot of track drivers contacted the infection it was a absolute standstill and the the whole industry was facing a crisis of how to deliver things uh with a contactless manner and you'd be amazed that the how the tracking industry is leveraging on the benefits of technology they're launching paperless transactions enabling a lot of contactless working between the driver and the whole logistics personnel on the ground and minimizing the physical interferences a truck a truck driver today on a phone call launching of an app can pick up the cargo without a contact print the labels in a perhaps a bluetooth printer paste it on the on the, on the cargo deliver the cargo and while the cargo is delivered it it sends a link to to the to the receiver saying that has has the cargo been delivered please click on the link saying yes as soon as that yes is given uh, you know that that is counted as a receipt so there is no question of signature or a physical contact which is coming in and then the whole payment cycle of starts because the logistic industry is so much also dependent on this payment cycles because the proof of payment the proof of delivery is such an important document that this could all be resolved through this digital management of the logistical deliveries and uh, needless to mention that even today in industries like the logistic and tracking industries executives are working from their offices or homes rather than customer visits and and contracts are executed through an e mode rather than a physical mode which is a major change the next uh, case that i'm perhaps to talk to you and if you look at this picture if it is clear to you is about the same logistic industry the passenger cargo flight so before you look at this picture and you understand what's going on here what happened was when the flights were grounded uh, what we did not realize that most of the passenger flights were carrying a lot of cargo in their in their hold so along with the grounding of the passenger flights uh, the cargo shipment all international cargo shipment almost suffered a heavy heavy Uh, damages around that and but there are pure play cargo flights but they were overbooked and the freights uh, shot up uh, highly shot up uh, freights it was got skewed so it was an ingenuity to discover that okay let us take out this wide body aircrafts which are essentially uh, passenger aircrafts and let's put cargo in the seats where the passenger was supposed to sit and taking into safety norms secure them on the seats and that's the picture you see uh, there's uh, this whole plane which is full of cargo in the passenger cabins even there are cargo on the on on the top of the of the baggage holds and uh, in its own place for cargo and this plane was started operating as passenger cargo flights that also gave the airlines the benefit of being able to operate this planes which otherwise were grounded and was having a maintenance issue so there is a case study of ingenuity of how the logistic industry responded to this crisis in my <laughs> final slide Uh, this has been also touched upon uh, by mr moore i would like to talk about a bit on mobility of white collar workers in the service industry a, a very recent development what we see what uh, as post covid is that industries like it consulting banking insurance and others where uh, there's a presence of white collar workers enablement of remote working has become stronger than ever before there's a strong reliance that with help of security with with the network security and enablement of the hardware and the software the professionals would be able to deliver work from any geography so the geographical barriers would break down 
and that would cause a lot of empowerment and make the job markets much more fluid and you'd see that somebody who wants to work in a mumbai market would be able to work from kolkata there would be a lot of more remote locations and offices might take a very different shape where you may find a lot of small satellite offices opening up and people would be visiting such offices and it would be a great time for the white collar workers because they would be having a lot of fluidity and a lot of empowerment to go across the job markets so that you know brings uh, us some of to some of the aspects of the changes in the service sector and there are two other things that i wanted to mention also you know india is supposed to become one of the vaccines hub in the world we are all hearing about how india is supporting the global vaccine programs and manufacturing of various vaccines now this vaccine also require a lot of cold chains so there would be a need to development of cold chains along to support that vaccination program because even with the covid vaccination program if you are not able to build enough cold chains that we will not be able to consume our own produce for our own purpose so once that happens this whole building of this cold chains a part of that capacity would also get released for other purposes like retail like you know uh, fresh uh, food farm produce like other healthcare services so that would also be a strong enabler in creating that cold chain logistics which otherwise would not have received this investment without the vaccination program and last but not the least uh, the whole sale of washing machines and uh, dishwashers gives an indication that perhaps the urban indian middle class is also becoming extremely self reliant in doing their own household work so with that i end my presentation and would be ready for any questions thank you so much thank you mr joydi banerji and mr kostab dashgupta for such enriching and informative speeches uh on digital learning on the areas like digitalization of payment and banking to take telemedicine so definitely um, we will be self reliant in coming days uh, next we will start with our question and answer session the moderator uh, of such session are professor ishika ghosh and professor nirupam dash faculty of commerce herombo chandra college so over to the question and answer session thank you ma'am uh, joydi banerji sir we have a question from the audience can i put uh, the question sir yes please can you am i am i audible yes sir you are audible okay okay sir the question is from rahul gar that how the government and the industry generate new jobs for the employees who lost their jobs due to covid 19 and what steps can be taken for that it's over to you sir just a minute let me let me just go through the question sir again i repeating the question okay, okay, okay. how i have seen i have seen okay sir thank uh, you sir question is from mr garg right yes sir how the government and industry generate new jobs for the employees who lost their jobs due to covid 19 what steps can be taken okay see this is a um, uh, issue uh, where um, the entire economy is thinking and rethinking there are there are various facets of this particular uh, job restoration one is if the industries can reach to the pre covid level or if they can exceed that they will always need manpower so in order to uh, get back the job the number of job uh, requirement will always be restored if the production capacity of industries gets restored that is one side of the story the other side is it is not only the uh, employees who have lost the job i would look at it from a bit different angle 
that is um, if you look at the post covid era the job nature if you differentiate one is the routine type of jobs the other one being the skilled jobs one is the routine type of job the other one if it is the skilled job then there is a possibility that routine job requirement will gradually get a bit reduced because more and more of digitization more and more of artificial intelligence uh, more and more of technology there is a possibility that the job requirement of the routine nature will get transformed to more and more requirement of skill job so my advice will be if you are having a futuristic outlook you you are anybody who is, who who wants to take a job in future need to develop a skill which is relevant in fact government is also bringing in lot of measures to restore it but the factual bottom line is such that more and more skill is required to deliver because our outlook the uh, uh, indian economy's outlook from the futuristic perspective is to be self reliant and export the surplus to outside world to be more st strong in supply chain which i said those things will bring in additional job uh, requirement hopefully this answers the question thank you sir for your uh, expert opinion sir you have another question sir from navendu bonik can i put the question sir yes please if you can uh, put it here also sir uh, what he asked that do you think that without purchasing power of lower level people msme sector may prosper their business and industrial growth see this is a very basic requirement that purchasing power of all individuals must improve it is not a matter of msme only i would say that consumption will be impacted unless and until purchasing power improves msme is no exception to that does this answer uh, the question put forward thank you sir for your uh, opinion and this is really helpful uh, for us to follow the post covid situation Uh, so our audience have been suggested to put their question in the chat box and will deliver your question to the expert resource person so our we are requesting our audience to put your question in the chat box if you have any question so the next question is to uh, mr kostab dash gupta it is from mr otishman lahiri he is also a faculty member of hiramu chandra college and his question is whether telemedicine is going to replace traditional medical sectors in the coming days if so whether it is feasible in india to uh, start hello. such thing hello hello can i be so you are audible sir. hello 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 so you are audible. audible can you can you see the question can you see the screen yes i can see I think if Mr. Banerjee can carry on.
is there any other question that you are having do you want me to me to answer this or kostab उट but it is the traditional medicine sectors are the telemedicine is going to combine that with it for certain consultations you need not go to the doctor at all uh, and it can be done over uh, telemedicinal uh, con conferences and a lot of interim checks or say a, a, a need to go to the hospital for a check up if you get your reports that can be discussed over a video call for example so that would reduce the number of patients visiting the hospital reduce the chances of infection and uh, put a lot of less pressure on the uh, on the hospital system to accommodate more serious patient on that particular day than a uh, relatively follow up patient etc or many other things can be managed from home for example israel is very leading uh, you know uh, proponent of telemedicines and they devised various uh, you know gadgets by which they could manage covid patients very effectively from home with the help of an hospital support so uh, today's our our the unpreparedness that the whole uh, in the pandemic uh, caught us shows that uh, if there was a better uh, infrastructure around telemedicine the whole management of covid patients at home could be done better though the, though our systems geared up our, our our system responded to it very uh, well i'm not criticizing it but all i'm saying is that even a preparedness for a for uh, another pandemic god forbid or any other crisis where a person cannot uh, visit the hospital for certain period of time then telemedicine is perhaps one of the most reliable fallback option but it has to be developed a very specific purpose has to be infrastructure and the whole software and the system has to be geared for it so definitely it cannot absolutely uh, replace what is going on that is not possible but it will only aid in it and as i said in most of the 70% of the cases there will be some kind of a scope for involvement of a telemedicine uh, so we have another question to mr kosab uh, can i can i can i add one more thing to what um, kosab has said regarding this yes, telemedicine sir. yes sir please See, what has happened really is the, it is not so the intent has never been such to replace the physical medicine uh, supply with telemedicine it is basically an option an enabler that got activated because of the crisis situation that has suddenly cropped up we all know necessity is the mother of invention so this necessity has pushed us to innovate and bring in such things which has acted as very positive triggers and enablers on one hand secondly if you think of the health sector today prevailing in the country so far as the cities are concerned they are reasonably getting the health support but if you go deep into the interior the rural sector do we really have that much of health care um, facility in the rural sector this can act as an enabler to those people who are staying in the rural sector as well so with the data becoming the primary um, enabler if once the digitization penetrates the various rural sectors these are offshoots of data this basically the entire these are opportunities that emerged we can take it from this angle as well over thank you sir there is another question to mr kosab dasgupta uh, from mr suraj sharma will introducing new bylaws for such digital digitalization will be sufficient or any other measures for safety of data can be taken just 
want some more measures if possible Can you see the question? I'm sorry, because of the audibility, I'm in an extremely difficult position. But uh, bylaws of digitalization of the safety of the data, the question is the safety of the data would have to go through compliance checks. And uh, that would and organizations would have to be heavily penalized. And there has to be clear cut organization systems by which the safety of the data is adhered to. And you know, uh, we have uh, data protection laws in, in very strong data protection laws across US and Europe, and we have such laws also in our country being introduced. Uh, but it a lot depends on the business entity to be able to equally store that data, make it subject to audits, and make it as an organization culture that that data is never compromised with, and uh, build up an uh, adequate uh, you know information security uh, lockers and uh, I mean some 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 other password protections and some other rings of protections to ensure that no data leakage happens uh, but definitely bylaws and rules would not be enough the organizational response to such compliances and a strong audit system would happen but imagine but but remember one thing that if the reputation of the organization is at a stake of of being able to not deal with that data sufficiently and with 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 the right uh, conservation and compliances then the perhaps the business model of that organization would fail so here the that is extremely important so organization would respond to that uh, extremely uh, severely to be able to protect their business models okay so we have our next question to mr joydi banerji it's from Mr. Shomir Kumar Sinha. We are in a global world. How balancing self-reliance and remaining global can be made, particularly when physical movement is imperative, like tourism, traveling sector? We can't hear. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Um, actually, I need a sorry. clarification on this question. Uh, do you mean to say that uh, when the traveling is getting impacted, physical movement is getting impacted, how can we maintain the balancing in the through the global world? This is this the question? It seems this is the question. The point is, the point is, um, uh, it is not the physical movement that will get stopped in the long run. It is not possible. But today, yes, it has been grossly impacted. In future, while this movement will happen, it will be, it will start on a measured basis. It will be it will be on a through various protocols and it will be restricted. But that will not stop 
an economy from being self-reliant because when you are um, strengthening your own value chain by increasing the productivity of the supply chain, your requirement of import gets reduced to the extent you are having the capabilities. If you go beyond that, imports will happen and whatever excess production you make beyond the requirement of self-reliance that you can surely export and for that any kind of communication as we said we have been saying that data is playing the most critical role of connecting across the globe thank you sir uh we think we have another question to post the banner post of dasgupta sir from shivashish datto can we have the question on the screen sir this is over to you sir yes i think that's a very great question that artificial intelligence or cloud computing have positive influence on marginal people remaining in the bottom of the pyramid now of course uh, now these advancement of these technologies are not going to uh, be in the forefront of solution of, of solving those problems those problems would have to be solved through broader economic policies that are adopted by the government the economic reforms and uh, you know in the under the current situation that the packages etc so it's a more of a governance and a political issue to get the marginal people up that up that uh, you know ladder so while well, that would happen but what uh, artificial intelligence and cloud computing would do is that it would definitely make things much more affordable it would bring down costs it would increase the scalability of achieving such challenges and cause a lot of faster turnaround times so when it causes these benefits into any particular process then uh, it 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 definitely delivers that value that the business is looking for and when the business gets uh, the value at certain lower cost or at a certain speed uh, that uh, definitely is going to uh, make its uh, value proposition back to its customers much more better so the so ultimately the customer is going to gain uh, so your the individual you are talking about would have certain purchase power purchasing power definitely or or would be beneficial to certain government programs now artificial intelligence and cloud computing would be used by the government or the infrastructure or the police or the administration anybody uh, so so the technology itself would be a big, very big enabler whether you uh, whether the private sector uses it or the government sector uses it uh, so definitely that would be helpful thank you sir uh, ishika do you have uh, any other question from the audience yes there is one more question okay it's from mr abir bonik what kind of problems may be faced by a fresher <clears throat> Gustav, are you answering? Yeah, I'm having I? an audio problem. I'm not sure if okay, okay. is answering it. Okay, okay. Uh, can you just uh, put the question on screen once more, please? What kind of problems may be faced by a fresher? See, it's a matter of fresher's perception. What fresher wants, that is most important. If fresher just wants a job, will go uh, just go to office do some routine job come back and do uh, some kind of adda then such kind of jobs will shrink if our economy really prospers to the level where we want to take it if we remain where we are maybe that uh, level may continue but if that fresher really wants to contribute to any organization and in turn to the economy 
he will he or she will have a ample opportunity to grow his or her skill and deliver in various forms even can turn out to be an entrepreneur there are a lot of startup motivations given through government initiatives they can contribute there there are a lot of skill jobs which will come up lot of new avenues which are opening up so basically it is a shift of entire mindset entire thought process that needs to be kept in mind we need to adapt fast and be agile So okay. there is another question. So there is one more question from uh, to Mr. Joydeep Banerjee from Mr. Onuran Guho. We have seen unprecedented levels of human migration across the country. If we talk about this weaker section of the society, how will they return to the mainstream economy? See this aspect. is getting uh, taken care of by various industry leaders and the government this is a much bigger aspect so far as the economy is concerned the sustainability is concerned and it is expected that uh, as we stabilize these things will also stabilize that is an expectation thank you sir uh, i think we have sorry just just one more thing but for that purpose basically Wait. it is too premature to discuss this why because we are not really having any solution to the covid 19 problem once we get some direct solution to the covid 19 automatically there will be a positive trigger to the entire economy including industrial sector agricultural sector or any sector so the, the automatically these things will be taken care of but for that first and foremost is a solution is required some vaccine some medicine which will quick fix the issue that is the danger that is there on account of this covid 19 I think we should stop the question answer session here because we are running short of time. So, if Paromita or Ishika want to continue with this, yes. Uh, now we will start. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Joydeep Banerjee and Mr. Kosta Dash Gupta sir. Uh, now we will start with our next session. Uh, that is the deep, the last session. Another thing that I would like to mention is that. a uh, feedback form will be activated tomorrow at the end of last day session i mean tomorrow session so feedback form will be activated tomorrow so now we have come to the last part that is the students debate session for that we are having our two judges dr joint ghosh and dr lili law uh, for our students debate session Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Okay, thank you. Thank you we so thank much. We thank both the speakers and invite them both for tomorrow's session because we have a session tomorrow also on the same topic. So we would request you to be present there also. Yes. Thank you so much. Uh, throughout uh, the session will be difficult for me, and <laughs> if if any question do come up, which. Uh, uh, for half an hour or so, I can definitely come in. You just that let me know. That is up to you, according to your convenience. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank sir. you so much. Thank you. Sir. So we have come to the last session. That is the students' debate session. For that, we are having two judges, Dr. Joyanto Ghosh and Dr. Lili Law.
Dr. Jayanta Ghosh is a faculty member of our department only, and Dr. Lily Law is a faculty member of the English department of our college. Yes. So we uh, request both of them to be present here as judges and continue with the debate. Debate session. Please give us some time. There must be some uh, technical glitches on the part of Professor Joanto Kosh. Please give us some time. We'd like to thank you for being with us and marking this spectacular evening with your glorious present. We'll have our next session within a few minutes. Just give us uh, some time. Now we'll have our next session. I think that is a very brainstorming session. It will be very brainstorming. So I'd like to call upon Professor Shatudruti Chakraborty to host the debate. Shatudruti, it's over to you. Very well, Good evening, respected dignitaries, my fellow colleagues, and welcome, dear students, for the first day of the debate session. The topic for debate tonight is unemployment is a bigger challenge than COVID-19. Representing the proposition, we have our first speaker, Shayana Paul, followed by our second speaker, Moshumi Chakraborty. Representing the opposition, we have our first speaker, Ayonabho Noshkar, and our second speaker, Sneha Aditya. On behalf of the House, I would like to express a sincere and warm welcome to our judges, Dr. Joyanto Ghosh and Dr. Lily Law, for uh, accepting the proposition to be judges on this debate panel. Dr. Joyanto Ghosh is a PhD holder from the University of Calcutta. He is an associate professor in the Department of Commerce, Herambu Chandra College. Dr. Lily Law is also a PhD holder from Jadavpur University. She is also an associate professor, Department of English, Herambu Chandra College. Each speaker will deliver a five minute in constructive speech. After each speech, I will immediately call upon the next speaker to deliver his or her address. I call upon our first speaker, Ms. Shayana Paul, to speak for the proposition for the next five minutes. Shayana, it's over to you now.
the opportunity good evening everybody our respected judges our honorable principal ma'am dr navanita chakraborty the professors our worthy co participants and all the faculty members today i would like to introduce myself i shauna paul from hermosondo college department of commerce hereby thanking for the motion and my topic is unemployment problem is a bigger challenge than food and if you have anything ma'am i would like to begin my work yes shauna thank you first of all we to those who are died due to this pandemic we are extremely sorry for their families to cope up with this situation we need a good treatment and more testing to happen but we know that the unemployment rate in all over world had spiked to a large extent according to cmie center for monitoring indian economy the unemployment rate for the month of july stands to that 7.43% down from nearly 24% during the month of april international labor organization ilo estimated that globally more than 25 million of jobs would be threatened due to this spread of corona virus european and asian countries have began to register huge job losses leading to a significant rise in unemployment rate ilo described covid as the worst global crisis since the world war 2 according to the indian international monetary fund imf the world faced the worst economic crisis since the great depression of 1930s we borrowed the model lockdown the, the lockdown model from european countries without considering the ground level reality of indian economy within days of lockdown the migrant issue was looming large We let them suffer without food, shelter, and job for two months. Finally, government gave up, and migrant workers, the majority of whom were infected, streamed out of urban red zones of the country and carried the infection into the green rural area, green rural zones. Hundreds of them have died in their way, and most of them was the only earning member of their families. Thus, the health crisis. Predictably lead to the economic crisis. The sudden stopping down of all the production and distribution lead to a total collapse of the economy, rendering millions jobless. About 93 million of workers, such as farmers, daily wage workers, and those who are uh, work under contractual work, have been most affected. Added precautions such as social distancing, contract tracking. Strict health controls over entry at any workplace and market would also impact the employer-worker relationship. This indicates that the current uh, international inter, uh, national-wide lockdown has been the biggest job destroyer ever in the history. I would like to ask my fellow participants that if a person not able to fulfill his or her basic requirements to survive, then how could he or she can uh, can afford the uh, treatment of COVID, which is quite expensive these days? He or she will even try to die uh, due to hunger before getting infected by the virus, right? So this is the question I throw uh, to my uh, fellow participants, and it's upon them. Uh, thank you. I'm done now. Thank you, Shayana, for your remarks. I now call upon the first speaker from the opposition, Ayonabo Noshkar. Ayonabo, it's over to you now. Thank you, ma'am, for this opportunity. A very good evening to all my esteemed speakers and judges, respected professors and faculty members, and to all of our fellow participants, and to all of my dear friends. And specially, once again, thanks to our principal, Dr. Navonita. Chakraborty, for giving me this opportunity to perform on this platform at today's session. I am Arun Nagunnaskar from Hirambar Chandra College, Department of Commerce, and I will be speaking on the topic: unemployment problem is bigger challenge than COVID-19, and which is again assumption. Well, as we all know, being employment is obviously essential, at least to fulfill the basic needs and to live our livelihood in a Smooth manner. Likewise, if we 
think big concentration this think big concentration then we can understand i witnessly that on the other hand covid 19 has also reached at its highest peak in respective of status of development in this case i again i wanted to mention that in 2003 when sars virus hit china china china's gdp was 1.6 trillion dollars but today china's gdp is around 13 trillion dollars due to this company also looking for company also looking for way to boost their bottom line and even the company like starbucks announces closure more than half of 4000 4100 stores in mainland china and the company which is not retailer closing stores like h and m also declared also declared closure 45 locations and the company ikva also shut off its 30 stores in mainland china and lastly i want to mention that the plants like coca cola have also been affected except all those above mentioning facing challenges there are many more challenges such as such as shortage in medical supplies providing beds to covid 19 patients and most of all difficulty stopping its spread because it is totally a new a new born disease virus as we all know previously top five affected countries from the virus is are the art usa art usa italy spain germany and iran and fact is that all these country have a stronger capacity to sub their product than india though we are still developing country right so still somehow they are getting fill whereas india is still fighting irrespective of all difficulties in this case again i wanted to mention that 6 million white collar workers lost their job during this lo- lockdown while 5.9 million workers white collar workers lost their job between may to august 2020 over the previous four months ended on 30 april ended on 30 april this jobless job loss number stood at 6.6 when compared with may august 2019 even economists and the global institution like the asian development bank and recently cut india's growth projections from already historic lows as the virus continues to so as my previous speaker said mr ms fayana paul and may my next participant will also are going to be said the uh, mrs uh, ms mosumi chakraborty that still we think that the unemployment problem is bigger than covid 19 of course not i do not agree with them because covid 19 is totally the new one disease virus and we do not know the exact medicine and even we are facing all those all those problem which i have previously discussed so i think if we cannot cope up with this covid 19 virus is then i think that unemployment problem will still remain as a permanent only so as per my opinion i would like to suggest to each and every one that who are presented here today that just because of this virus whole economy is getting destroyed so depending on the present pandemic dangerous situation i hope that we all must meet to take care covid 19 as a biggest challenge for now at least and make ourselves a winner against the new one diseases virus and before ending my speech i must want to leave a question for everyone to look for what over the matter that is really unemployment problem is bigger challenge than covid 19 or covid 19 is one of the biggest challenge than unemployment thank you this is is my opinion and opinion may vary it's up to totally judge it thank you thank you ayunavo for your remarks i now call upon the second speaker who will speak for the proposition moushumi chakraborty moushumi it's over to you now ma'am can i start now yes good evening to the respected principal dr navonita chakraborty respected judges audience and all the resource person present here i am moshumi chakraborty from herombachandra college from the commerce department and i will be speaking for the motion 
unemployment is a bigger challenge than covid 19 an initial assessment of the covid 19 on the global world says that the effects will be far reaching pushing millions of people into unemployment underemployment and working poverty and proposes measures for a decisive coordinated and immediate response the economic and labor crisis created by the covid 19 pandemic on the global world could increase unemployment uh could increase unemployment almost 25 million the initial assessment note that calls for urgent large scale and coordinated measures across three pillars protecting the workers in the workplace stimulating the uh, economy and the un un unemployment and supporting jobs and incomes these measures include extending social protection supporting employment retention and financial and tax reliefs for both medium small and small sized enterprise and fiscal and monetary policy and providing fiscal and providing financial assistance to all these specific economic sectors of the economy based on the different scenarios of the impact of covid-19 uh, the ilo estimates that between 5.3 million and 24.7 million jobs could be lost worldwide unemployment is a also a bigger problem in the covid-19 situation as a result there is a decrease in the consumption of goods and services in the economy uh, fall falls in employment uh, also large also depicts that large income Loss, losses for workers and there is a decrease in the consumption of goods and services in the economy and working poverty is, has also increased significantly to a large extent and the ilo estimates that between 8.8 .8 million and 35 million uh, people could be close to or below the poverty line and self employment in developing countries which often stops as a cushion for the impact of changes may not work this time as a as there is a restrictions on the movement of people also so there is a devastating situation so uh there will be a large in uh, there will be a large disproportionate distributions of income and there will be a inequalities in income of the people and particularly the younger and the older ones will suffer from this and women and migrants too so migrants will be uh, will vulnerably be uh, be feeling less protected as a result of lack of social protection rights and women are tend to be over represented in lower paid jobs and affected sectors and uh the assessment of the international labor organization depicts that there will be a devastating situation after the post covid 19 situation and and the international labor organization's director general guy rider also told that there is not no there is no longer only a global health crisis but also but also economic crisis and labor crisis which is having a lot of impact on the people so to cope up with so to cope up in this situation we have to follow the various government policies and uh, the international labor standards which are issued by the international labor organization to get back into the normal course of life and we, and in this way we can get back into the sustainable and equitable economy and there will be a stabilization in the economy now we are facing the problem of recession so to get back into the normal course we have to we have to coordinate among the among ourselves to get back into the normal course and uh, the investment should also increase and the people should invest more in this situation so that the flow of so that the flow of income increases in the economy so i would like to conclude my speech by saying that covid 19 is a big problem for the people or unemployment is a bigger problem for the people people have lost their uh, 
people have lost their people of people has lost their jobs and could not earn their livelihood so how will they uh, so how will they, how will they be able to live their livelihood if they do not have the money and they will not be able to do the treatment also properly because of because many of them are losing their jobs they are they are facing the problem so to get back into the normal situation unemployment problem should be uh, should be reduced so that so that the normal course of business could be started again and they, and we will be able to get back previously as soon as possible i have concluded my speech thank you moshumi i now call upon our last speaker for the day sneha aditya who will speak for the opposition sneha over to you now judges respected professors esteemed speakers and all my fellow college mates i am sneha aditya from hermachandra college department of commerce um and i'm here to speak against the topic unemployment is a bigger problem than covid-19 in my opinion covid uh being a communicable disease resulted in complete lockdown which in turn actually has resulted in unemployment So actually covid is the root cause of causing unemployment in this current year and unless and until we get a permanent solution for covid-19 um everything else is secondary and unemployment will remain as a problem in india today i'm going to speak four points to justify my opinion firstly covid-19 has created a fear in the minds of the business persons for which they are actually not able to invest in any share markets or in any other businesses and if we all know if there is no investment uh, business will automatically start shut down many of the small and the medium scale businesses has already been shut down and moreover this year has been recorded the highest number of businesses going bankrupt not only in us but also all over the world leading to unemployment the statistics is somewhat like this that um before the pandemic the rate of unemployment was 7% but in this pandemic like during this pandemic in 2020 the rate actually rose to 27% which is nearly more than triple of what it was before according to cmie and also pondicherry um became the biggest victim of this problem with the highest unemployment rate of 75.8% all over the country now to my second point which is economic um a recession has been caused due to covid-19 which actually led to unemployment we all know in india there are very few organizations actually um like the it sectors who facilitate people to do work from home people who work from um in the construction businesses or like in steel factory or in other uh, manufacturing units they actually can't uh, do their work from home and they also have a difficulty in maintaining the social distance if they ever go in physical to visit their site leading to lowering the productivity um resulting in lowering the revenue generation uh leading to huge losses and no earning which ultimately leads to unemployment now my third point is covid-19 also caused many workers to get jobless um is leading in rising the unemployment rate this is because many workers like there were total 98 days of lockdown um in our like whole country many workers during this lockdown who actually used to work on a daily wage rate basis they have gone back to their homeland and are not ready to come back unless and until the covid situation has been taken care of leading to unemployment now my last and final point which is my fourth point actually a conclusion to is that covid is solely responsible for creating debts and unemployment among the millions we all know covid has taken away so many lives of people and especially in a country like india where the population is so high covid has actually taken away more lives of people than unemployment would have taken in a short run and obviously if we are not alive ourselves out there who would even care to get employed right actually um there is also another fact that india is a developing country and unemployment has always been a problem in india um actually this pandemic has made the unemployment rate rise um so and also according to cmie which is the center of indian economic indian economy states that 
uh, another 25 million people will be uh, like jobless due to this pandemic. So basically my point of saying all this is that also every strong point my fellow opponents will say they have to believe this fact that the pandemic is responsible for creating everything and it is the COVID-19 basically which has to be like which is uh, which has become a necessary point and a bigger problem which has to be taken care of immediately and if COVID-19 is solved like the problem is solved then automatically the problem of unemployment in India will come back to normal. I hope I can justify my opinion. And I would like to present now just two questions to all the people, uh, like everyone listening to me out here. First, which one is necessary? Lives of people are getting involved. And secondly, is it really unemployment, which is a bigger problem, or is it COVID-19, which has become the biggest problem all over the world and has to be taken care of? Thank you. Thank you, Sneha, for such a lucid presentation. We have almost come to the end of the debate session. On behalf of the House, I would like to thank the judges for their assistance. I would like to congratulate all the debaters for their performances. And I would like to profusely thank the audience for your attentiveness. I now conclude the debate session. Paramita ma'am, please unmute. Yes. Thank you, our participants and our judges. Now, we have come to the last part of today's session. Now, it's my privilege as a convener of this international webinar to propose the vote of thanks for today's session. We are looking forward for tomorrow's session. I, on behalf of the entire Department of Commerce and Department of IQAC, and extending a very hearty vote of thanks to the honorable speakers of today's session, the audiences, and my fellow colleagues. Thank you for joining us. We are looking forward for, a, for an enriching session and a more informative session tomorrow. Thank you. And I will add a few words. Uh, the debate session for today, the results for this session will be declared tomorrow after because we have the second session of debate tomorrow. So we will declare the results uh, together. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for your patience and for joining us.